Good evening. It's our great joy to have you come join us this evening for a time to celebrate the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me briefly give a couple of quick announcements before we get underway tonight. First off, if you're visiting with us tonight, we are delighted that you've chosen to come and worship with our congregation here at Woodruff Road. And I want to invite you as well as encourage you to join us for worship tomorrow morning at 930 and as well as again in the evening at 6 p.m. And tomorrow, there's just a friendly reminder that there is no Sunday school after the morning worship service. Instead, we'll have a wonderful time of extended classic fellowship in the gym. So I do hope you've already made plans to join us for that time tomorrow morning. To the believers of the Old Testament, the arrival of the, of the one who would bruise the serpent's head must have seemed like a very long time. Since God people had been hoping for Christ's coming ever since the, the divine proclamation of Genesis 3.15, they were often heard crying out, how long, Lord? Friends, God may seem slow, but he is always on time. He has never been late. For the New Testament believers, those this side of the cross, we know that winter was not forever, for the long-promised Christmas has indeed finally come. As a blood-bought believer, as a people, for his own possession, we've experienced the dawn of redeeming grace because Christ the Savior is born. Jesus is our mediator, and as the Heidelberg Catechism tells us, with his innocence and perfect holiness, he removes from God's sight our sin. Let's now stand in response to this great news and take your Trinity Psalter hymnals, turning to hymn 319, as we sing, O Come, All Ye Faithful, hymn 319.
Please pray with me. Our Father, we gather tonight to glorify the Lord Jesus. We praise you for his, his life, and we praise you, Lord, for your eternal Son, the one who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who is and remains true and eternal God, who took to himself through the working of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a truly human nature, so that he might become David's true descendant, like his brothers in every way except for sin. We praise you that in your goodness and mercy you sent forth your Son, and that Christ was not born of ordinary generation, and that through the virgin birth he's clean of sin and keeps your law perfectly. We praise you for his two natures and for his perfectly obeying of the law on our behalf in his active obedience and for taking on of sin for us in his passive obedience. We praise you that Christ once and for all death, the just for the unjust, defeated the grave and in his victory and conquering of death and his raising from the grave three days later, it justifies us immediately with you. We praise you, Lord, that through the imputation of your son's righteousness, you, almighty God, are both just and the justifier to the one whose faith is placed in Jesus Christ alone, so that all those who come to him might enter into your kingdom, and through faith are not only saved, but also sanctified, because he is the firstborn among many brethren. We praise you that in Christ we are justified and adopted into your family, and we're sanctified and further sanctified by the gospel that saves us. That until that day in which Christ returns once and for all, we are no longer saved from just the penalty and power of sin, but glorified and saved from the very presence of sin. We thank you this evening, Lord, for keeping your promise to Adam and for sending us your son, the one who has bruised the head of the serpent. What a marvelous hope we have in the one whose birth changed everything. So we pray, O oh Lord, that tonight you would loosen our tongues and that now, Lord, we might praise the Lord Jesus with all the honor and respect due his name for all his glory as our Redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand again. And take your Trinity Psalter hymnals, turning to him 323, and we'll sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Hymn three.
take now your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 for our New Testament reading and continue to stand as we reverence the Word of God. This is God's holy and errant and authoritative Word to us. Please pay careful attention. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Let's now respond to the word by taking your Trinity Psalter hymnals and turn to hymn 317 as we sing, What Child Is This? as people hidden away in the most unlikely places. Tomorrow morning, believers will gather to worship the triune God in North Korean caves and Iranian prisons. When Elijah was pouting in 1 Kings 19 and thought he was the only faithful Christian, the Lord corrected him by reminding him, Elijah, I have 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah is shocked because his, his view of the church is so narrow and provincial. 
he can't imagine that the Lord would be gathering and saving and sanctifying people anywhere else other than right next to him. And that is how many of you, the wise men, I hope you'll have, look at your Bible once again at Matthew chapter 2. For a lot of reasons tonight, we're going to go into some depth and we're going to cure up a lot of speculation. There were people who couldn't fathom that God had his elect in other places in the first century except the regions of central southern Palestine. But there are dozens of ways a gospel message of a redeemer could have made it to the land of the wise men by captives from the northern kingdom who had been carted off by Assyria, or captives from the southern kingdom who were taken to Babylon, or sailors or merchants from Israel, or we could go on. But many struggle just as well to find and figure out where Melchizedek, Jethro, and Job came from. But just like them, and I hope you'll look at these men with me, these wise men, for they have much to teach us tonight and especially tomorrow. Just like them, these wise men seem to appear out of nowhere, but as mature, godly, righteous men. We're going to study the word in some depth tonight for your edification. Let's pray together and seek the help of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, we need the help of the Holy Spirit because we confess that we prefer the stories of men and the speculations even of men to the truths that are revealed in your word. So tonight we ask that you'd show us Jesus and teach us to worship and adore him. Enable us to marvel at your providence tonight. We pray in the name of the one who came all the way down from heaven for our salvation, even Christ the Lord. Amen. Look at Matthew 2 verse 1 and see the context of this saga. When our narrative begins, the birth of Jesus has already occurred. We are told so in verse 1 that this occurred after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That birth that had been prophesied since Genesis 3.15. That birth that occurred by supernatural conception without the aid of a human father. And the birth of Jesus has occurred in Bethlehem. Notice in verse 1, once again, the location of the birth is stated to remind you that Jesus' birth fulfilled prophecy, the Old Testament prophecy of Micah 5 two, that the Redeemer would be born there. Even though it was a tiny nowhere town, Jesus is born there to show his humility. This is just a wide spot in the road. But he's born there in a town, which means Bethlehem, which means house of bread since he would be the bread of life who came down from heaven. And he's born, and all these events take place, look at verse 1, in the reign of King Herod. Herod the Great had been ruling at that point for 35 years. And he'll die soon after this incident. Herod was a, a fantastic politician, an immensely gifted man, skilled in things like martial arts, rhetoric, and politics. He was an administrator and a builder, but in his later life, he became unbelievably cruel, and he exerted all his efforts just at retaining power. He was paranoid. He perpetually feared plots on his life. He just knew somebody was trying to overthrow him, and so he killed his wife, Marianne, and then he killed all three of his sons because he thought one of them might try to stage a coup. And what we'll see tomorrow morning in Matthew 2.16 in, in the following reading is he'll execute a death sentence on all the children of Bethlehem in the hopes of killing Jesus just because he thinks this infant might dethrone him. So look at who these mysterious visitors were. Look carefully at verse 1 of Matthew 2. We are told that they're wise men from the east. The first thing you should notice is they're wise men. The word there is magi. In the Old Testament, Daniel and his friends were magi as well, brilliant men, schooled in wisdom and counsel, much like the cabinet of a president. These men would have been highly educated. They would have had the modern-day equivalent of a Ph.D. And notice they come from the East. Now, this rules out a lot of faulty views. They may have come from Babylon, present-day Iran, or India, or even China. And there are good reasons to think all of those are the case. But the important thing to recognize is they're Gentiles. These are the first fruits, the down payment of that great Gentile harvest being brought into the church. It's a foreshadowing as well of that day when all of the world's wisdom will bow the knee to Christ. These men 
come fulfilling prophecy. For example, in Isaiah 60, the prophecy is given, Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Now, let me tell you and let me clear up. I hope I'm not going to ruin story time at your house tonight with this. But there is so much faulty speculation about these wise men. There have been people actually said, Carl, where are the names of those wise men in the Bible? Aren't their names Melchior and Gaspar and Balthazar? No. Rome says that their bones were buried by St. Helena. Fidel Castro said in a speech in 1979 that these men were the first Marxists in history. So let me debunk some of this silliness. The text tells us of three gifts. There were probably a lot more. Think of the Queen of Sheba's gift to Solomon in 1 Kings 10. She came with gold and spices and precious stones. Does that sound familiar? It's what you brought to a great king. And by some hints in the text, there were probably dozens of these magi, of leaders, soldiers, and servants in an entourage that had traveled close to or more than a thousand miles over difficult and dangerous terrain. This group was large enough so the report of its arrival in town reached King Herod himself. Now, they weren't kings, so you're thinking of that song, We Three Kings of Orient Are, they weren't kings. They are counselors to kings. They're wise men. And because they're so mysterious, we don't have their country of origin or their names or their number. Many have sought to fill in the blanks with speculation and foolishness. But what is overlooked is the most important thing is their believers. They firmly believed that Jesus was the king of the Jews. They were not coming to be convinced. They already knew that Jesus was the great king. Now, look at why they came. Look at verse 2. Because they had seen a star. Once again, there are all kinds of theories about this star. Some have surmised that the star was an exploding supernova that slowly drifted across the sky. And others have said that the Magi saw a planetary conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. Still others have said this was Halley's Comet. And others have said the reason why the Magi came is because they were astrologers. We know better. God always condemns astrology, for example, Isaiah 47. But we do know that God drew these men and called them by this star. The text says so. So what was this star, and how did this star get the Magi from the east to Jerusalem? We don't know. And let me exhort you not to become too preoccupied with developing theories that will only be speculative and have no spiritual significance. In the last 35 years of my ministry, I've seen people who are completely preoccupied by how the Red Sea divided, or how the manna fell, or how Jonah survived in the belly of the fish, These are those people who have a mind for the marginal. They usually don't cherish the great central truths of the gospel, the holiness of God, the ugliness of sin, the helplessness of man, and the death of Christ, justification by faith alone, and sanctification by the work of the Holy Spirit. These are people who always seem to be hovering around the periphery. They don't get the point. We aren't given a detailed description of the star. If we needed it, God would have included it. We aren't told how the Magi connected this star with the birth of Jesus. But what is plain concerning the matter of the star is this. It was pointing these men to Jesus so they might worship him. And there's only one person who can control planets and stars. And that is the sovereign Lord. By his providence, he controls all things, people and planets and life and death. That was God's design then and is now. His aim is that the nations worship his son. In fact, he'll not be satisfied until every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. So look at verse 2. They know, these wise men do, they know that the king of the Jews had been born. This is what they say to anybody who will talk to them when they come into Jerusalem. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And they say in verse 2, they'd come with the stated intention of worshiping him. Now we're getting to the nub of what the wise men were about. Look carefully at verse 2. 
We're told we have seen his star in the east and we have come. In, this is a statement of intent. To worship him. That's it. What makes these men so fascinating is they're incredibly impractical. Their goal was to do something that unbelievers will never, ever understand. And that is to come and proclaim the worth of God. They come a long distance. They underwent danger and fatigue. They didn't come to Bethlehem to see or to be seen. They didn't come to Bethlehem to do business and to trade. They didn't come to Bethlehem because this is where their friends gathered. They didn't come to Bethlehem to catch up on news or gossip. They were single-minded. And this is a guide for every one of us every Lord's Day. Look at verse 2. We have come to worship him, period. Now, Herod gets in on the act. Look at verse 4. Herod hears all of this going on, and he's troubled. And so he begins to inquire. His last few years have been plagued by rivals, and now he perceives another threat to his rule. He feels like he's vulnerable to the claims of somebody who would be part of the Davidic dynasty. And notice, look at verse 3, the text tells us that all Jerusalem was troubled. Well, if a tyrant like Herod is troubled, everyone gets nervous. Now think about this. A large delegation of men show up in Jerusalem, speaking a different language, wearing different clothing. They show up in town and they buttonhole everybody on the street. And the only thing they want to know is this. Look at verse 2 in their question. Where? Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? Oh, no. Herod's not going to like this. And if Herod ain't happy, nobody's happy. And so notice what Herod does. He inquires. Look at verse 4, and this is why he's said to be sly as a fox. He inquires of the religious leaders. He calls in the chief priests and the scribes. And what's fascinating is this would be like calling in the most liberal of Democrats and the most conservative of Republicans, these two groups, the chief priests and the scribes, they stand at complete opposite ends of the Jewish leadership. And Herod knows that. The scribes were conservative teachers of scripture, bent on preserving traditional Jewish culture. The chief priests were Sadducees, theological liberals, men who were willing to accommodate Roman authority to retain their power. And Herod calls these two rivals, who couldn't stand the sight of each other, together before him to discuss this one question. Where is the Christ to be born? Look at verse 5 and 6. They all agree on this. They all agree on what the prophecy is. And they answer by quoting Micah 5 too. Well, the, the Christ is to be born in Bethlehem Ephrathah. And Herod recognizes if these two groups of men further apart than the most liberal and most conservative would be today, if they can agree on the answer that the Redeemer is to be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, it must be true. They know the prophetic scriptures after all. So stop and think with me for a moment. You would think at this moment, well, then why aren't they out in Bethlehem? Why aren't they rushing to the manger to see the Redeemer? Their failure to worship is not due to ignorance. Too bad Herod didn't go on and ask, who is the Christ to be? And they would have had to quote the rest of Micah 5 too. One whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. One who's eternal. One who's come out of eternity into time. After this little meeting with Herod, the priests went back to their temple rituals. The scribes went back to their copying of scriptures. And none of them showed the slightest interest in the fact that their scriptures had been fulfilled and their king had been born. And 30 years later, once again, it would be a conjoining of these two groups, the chief priests and the scribes who had condemned Jesus to death. Their successors, Annas and Caiaphas, would see to this. And so notice what the orders are. Look carefully at verse 8. Look at what the orders are that Herod gives to these foreigners. Now, what's a little bit funny to me is Herod has no jurisdiction over these people. They're foreigners. But he's bossy and used to telling people what to do. And so he tells them, go and search carefully for him. Find him and bring back word to me. 
Herod is employing this entourage of wise men as his private detectives. And he makes this all seem plausible and not devious by adding these words. I intend to go and be a worshiper also. But his intent is clear. He's a foe of the living God, an agent of Satan, an antichrist in the best sense of the word. And when he kills, tries to kill Jesus in verse 16, as we'll see in the morning, he's doing demonic work. He's a false king trying to kill the true king, murdering whomever gets in his way. Now, never forget, as you look at this section and look at what Herod's up to, never forget there are haters of God who would eradicate God's son and God's truth if they could. But we know, according to Psalm 2, that God sits in the heavens and laughs at their futile attempts. So now go back to this miracle of the star. Look at verse 9 and 10. When they heard the king, they, be, they departed, and behold, the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now, let's trace where this star has been. Look up to verse 2. The star started out in their far country, way off in the east, 500,000. 1,500 miles away, and the star had been guiding them all the way. This was God's means and tool for providence to guide them to worship his son. And now the star reappears. Look where it is in verse 9 and 10. It's over Jerusalem, and it's going to to move south just a few miles to Bethlehem. This luminous wonder, by the way, for those of you who know anything about astronomy, not astrology, for those of you who know anything, that... This star is moving from north to south, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and this is an incredibly odd way for a star to move. The star leads them and guides them directly to Jesus. It must have been hanging very low in the sky. Now, I want you to think about what the emotional, spiritual state of these wise men is at this moment. These are wise men, philosophers. These are calm, even-tempered, measured men, not given to outbursts. But look what they do in verse 10. When they come near to Jesus, we're told they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. The English text gets the the point across, but the Greek text is even more explicit. There's a quadruple way of saying they rejoiced. We would say they were really, very, astoundingly glad. This is a picture, isn't it? of men being drawn irresistibly to Christ. They must keep following until they get to Christ, even though it's expensive and time-consuming, even though it's insensible to friends and family back home. They must keep coming until they get to Jesus. They won't turn back. And then look what they do in verse 11. In verse 11, we are told that they worship Christ. They come as close as they can. They're not satisfied with distance. And notice their posture in verse 11. They fall down and worship him. Falling to the ground is what you do to say to someone, you're high and I'm low. You have exalted regal splendor and I am humbled in your presence. This shows absolute humility before a great king. But notice what's odd. It's adult men Falling, prostrating themselves, and bowing before an infant. And they bring the most lavish of gifts. Look at them there in verse 11. They're listed. Treasures, we are told, of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, of course, was the medal of kings. Rare and expensive. Gold was the symbol of royalty. Why would they bring gold to an infant in a feed trough? Because they already understood Christ's kingship. Look back to verse 2. What have they already confessed? Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? And these men are wise men. They know what's proper protocol. Oh, we are going to see a king better bring a lot of gold. Only the finest for this king. Their second gift they lay before Christ is frankincense. Now, for those of you who've sung about frankincense but don't know what it is, it's a, it's a yellow aromatic gum that can be easily pulverized. It's obtained by making incisions in the bark of certain Arabian trees. It was a key element in the preparation of incense 
for temple worship, we're told in Exodus 30. And do you know what this is symbolic of all through the Bible? Every time incense goes up, it's symbolic of the prayers of the saints. A third gift they bring to him. By the way, why would they bring the key ingredient of incense to Jesus? For he will be the intercessor par excellence. He will be the one of whom it is said in Hebrews 7, he always lives to make intercession for us. The third gift is myrrh. A sweet smelling herb that was used primarily by funeral preparers. Myrrh was folded into the grave clothes for a time and kept the stench of death from the dead body. In fact, after our Lord was shown to be dead and his body was taken down from the cross, we're told of Nicodemus in John 19 that he wrapped the body in linen with myrrh folded in. I've been to a lot of baptism parties, a lot of baby welcoming parties, and I've seen some strange gifts presented to babies. But nothing so out of place as this, myrrh, a gift that speaks of death. So these wise men bring gifts that speak of Christ's kingship, gold. His role as intercessor, frankincense. And his coming, atoning death, myrrh. Look at verse 12 and 13 and notice how the Lord protects. Our narrative closes with another example how the Lord, by means of his providential intervention, foils the plans of wicked men. We'll examine it in depth tomorrow morning in the preaching of the word. But I want to make five applications to you from this text. The first is that worship and adoration always mean bringing the most precious gifts to the object of our worship. The action and the gifts of the wise men are instructive for us. King David, the forerunner and predecessor of Jesus, once said in 1 Chronicles 21, I will not give the Lord that which costs me nothing. It should be your desire to bring that which is most valuable to you to bring and lay before Christ. When you bring the most precious of gifts to Jesus, it's in effect saying, I don't come with the hope of getting rich of things from you. I have come for you. And by this desire, I now intensify and demonstrate by giving up things in the hope of enjoying you more, not things. By giving to you what you do not need and what I might enjoy, I'm saying, Lord, you are my greatest treasure, not these things. A second application. Don't we see it in this text that God controls all creation to bring the nations to worship his son. He will move planets and stars around if it will bring people to adore the Lord Jesus. God is in the business of glorifying his son. And we see just one instance of this, of him taking a star out of its normal rotation and moving it where it will stand right over the humble barn where his beloved son is so that he can bring a group of worshipers who will adore his son. God is in the business of bringing the nations to worship his son. A third application we have to see is if we know the truth, even a little bit, we must act on it. The Magi knew very little. They knew that the king of the Jews had been born. The scribes there in Jerusalem knew much more and much better than the Magi, but the Magi acted on what they knew. They weren't passive hearers, but effectual doers. They left home and work and family to follow a star for weeks and then months. They went on a perilous journey, traveling on foul-smelling camels and donkeys, past bandits through difficult terrain, and into a dangerous foreign land. And they brought the most expensive gifts they could find, all to do what? To worship passionately. Think of the two radically antithetical responses to Jesus shown. There are men who have, like the the chief priests and the scribes, they have knowledge of the scripture, but they're apathetic. There are men that are orthodox and accurate, but hollow. These men know what the scriptures say, but they won't travel the six and a half miles 
down to Bethlehem to worship Christ. They made an A in prophecy and geography, but they flunked application. Then you have these other men. Men who are marked by a distinct spiritual diligence. No doubt it was costly. It was time consuming. You can imagine their wives saying, where are you going again? Why? It was dangerous to come to Palestine from Iran or India or China or wherever it was they came from. But none of these things fazed them. They knew that life didn't consist of seeking personal affluence and comfort, but in worshiping the king of kings, and they would not be turned back. A fourth application. This text shows us an amazing example of faith. These men believed in Christ, even though they'd never yet seen him. But this is not all. These men believed in Jesus when the scribes and priests were all unbelieving. But this is not all. These men believed in Christ when they see him as a helpless infant. They saw him perform no miracles to convince them. They heard no teaching to persuade them. They saw no signs of deity or greatness to all them. They saw nothing but a newborn infant, weak and small, needing a mother's care. And yet when they saw him, they believed that they were seeing the ruler of the world. You will find no greater faith in Scripture. My friend, you have so much more tonight. You have sitting on your lap the entire biblical record, which carefully shows all the miracles of Jesus, which carefully documents his astounding teachings. And so, my friend, tonight, if you do not believe in this Jesus, you are without excuse. A final application. This text is an amazing example of God's sovereignty. Why was the birth of the Lord Jesus made known to distant foreigners and not those who were close to home? Why does Jacob, why does the Lord choose Jacob and not Esau? Because it's the Lord's sovereign pleasure to hide truth from the worldly wise and to reveal it to the lowly. Tonight, if God has revealed his son to you, it is all out of his love, his mercy, and his sovereign good pleasure. Let's pray together. Our Father, we give you thanks for your word. Teach us to have such a passion to worship as we see exhibited by the wise men. Give us a desire to bring our finest gifts to Christ. And we ask that you would guide us to Christ, not by a star, but by your word directly to Jesus, that we would adore him. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Trinity Psalter, hymn known for our closing hymn. Let's stand and sing hymn 315, Silent Night, hymn 315.
you'll join us tomorrow for Lord's Day worship as we gather as we always do at 9.30 in the morning at 6 p.m. You're certainly invited with your whole family and all your guests are in town to join us at that time. Let's pray together. Our fathers, we have heard your word. Now give us the gift of faith to believe it. Prepare our hearts now for your holy day tomorrow. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Good night.